Okay, in this lesson, we're going to talk about metering devices. Now, metering devices are one of the four major components of a system. Remember, we have the, your compressor, you have your condenser, then we have our metering device, and we have our evaporators. There's two points of pressure change in a system. That's in the condenser and in the metering device. There's two points of change of state in a system. That's in our evaporator and condenser. But for the moment, let's talk about the metering device. Okay, the metering device has a basically one purpose, and that's to control the flow of refrigerant to the evaporator coil. It's supposed to maintain the correct superheat, and it creates the flash gas at the start of the evaporator coil. Okay, it's a point of pressure drop. We come into the metering device with high pressure liquid. We leave the metering device with low pressure liquid mixed with some vapor, which is called flash gas. Think of it as sort of the end, the spray nozzle on a garden hose. We have several types of metering devices we need to understand and talk a little bit about. We have the capillary tube. We have the thermostatic expansion valve, which is TXV. We have an automatic expansion valve. We have a fixed orifice that we basically see in air conditioning and heat pumps only and we have an electronic expansion valve. The capillary tube is the one that's non, is one of the few that's non-mechanical. It provides a constant flow or feed of refrigerant. It's non-adjustable, and its typical size is 0.031 inches in diameter. It's extremely small, which is like 1 32nd of an inch. It's sometimes used to form a heat exchanger by attaching it by solder to the suction line or by wrapping it around the suction line. Okay, what that does, it actually creates a larger superheat in the suction line, and it actually creates more subcooling in the cap tube before it sprays into the evaporator. The best way to cut a capillary tube is to gently notch it with a triangular file and then snap it at that point. You do not want to cut a capillary tube with like a pipe cutter or a pair of pliers. Okay, you have to gently notch it to just create sort of a place where it will break and then snap it. These things are extremely narrow inside. Installing a cap tube is done by crimp connections because of its diameter. What you basically do is you take a cap tube, you cut it to the proper length, and then you in push it into the copper tube it's connecting to on each side. Then you crimp down the other copper tube around the cap tube, making sure you don't crush it, and then you braze it on each side. Again, but you have to be very careful you do not crush the ends or the tubes. When replacing a cap tube, same length of the new tubing as the original one in the system. Make sure it's the same diameter. It's extremely important that length and diameter matter because of pressure drops. This is an example of a cap tube. Okay, you'll see the coil up in this area of the cap tube. And then this is actually attached directly to a filter dryer. So this is coming, this side is coming out of your um, liquid line. We're going through our cap tube, and this side connects into the tube right before the evaporator and actually sprays into the evaporator. Thermic sag expansion valves are the ones you're going to be seeing most often in the field now. They're known as TXVs. The TXV has a marking on the top designating a refrigerant type they can be used with. They're the most common on commercial refrigeration systems. The TXV is a temperature actuated metering device. The mal valve responds to load variations. The whole purpose of the TXV is to keep the temperature of the evaporator coil at a constant. There's a bulb that's attached to the suction line after the evaporator. The bulb must be insulated and mounted in a horizontal section. Now, be very careful on this. The bulb cannot be installed in the bottom of the line. We don't want it sensing the oil that's being returned to the evaporator. We want this to be a true sensing of the refrigerant temperature flowing through that line. And it should also be insulated. The sensing bulb senses the temperature in the suction of the line. And there's a gas that's in the bulb that will actually open or close the valve depending on whether or not the gas expands or contracts. Because remember, anytime I heat a gas, it expands. Anytime I cool a gas, it contracts. If the valve is not responding, the first thing you should do is check the strainer. 
The TXV is adjustable. Turning the adjustment counterclockwise sends more liquid into the coil, which reduces the superheat. You got this is an extremely important slide. You have to memorize this. There's no other way around it. There's no easy way. Counterclockwise sends more liquid into the coil, which reduces the superheat. Turning the adjustment clockwise chokes off the flow of liquid and increases the superheat. Make any adjustments very slowly and give the system time to respond. So this is sort of a um, make an adjustment, wait five minutes. Make an adjustment, wait five minutes. And be watching your superheat and your pressures and your compressor amperage very carefully. This is an example of a thermic sac expansion valve. Your adjustments are on the bottom, and this is normally covered by a brass cap down here on the bottom. This picture is showing with the grass, brass cap off. So what we have in here is you have your liquid line coming in on one side. Okay, We have our adjustment from the bottom. Again, there's a cap over this, but your refrigeration wrench will work on the part under the cap carefully. The spring pressure is what you're adjusting. And then this side comes out to the evaporator. Okay, it has a little needle in that allows the refrigerant basically to bypass more if the needle's pushed up or pushed down, it cuts it off. Okay, so this is a, this is an example of it starting with an equalized setting. Okay, 10 degrees superheat. Okay, R12, it's an older refrigerant, but you know what? It works for our example. So my system is running normally. It's in an equal position, the bulb pressure is pushing down with 46.7 PSI. The spring and evaporator pressure are pushing up with the same amount of force. So we're at exactly an equilibrium. As load conditions change and heat is added to the conditioned space, the sensing bulb starts warming up, the valve opens, and allows more liquid to the evaporator, lowers the superheat. So now my bulb pressure is at 52 PSI. It's pushing down. My spring and evaporator pressures are still at the 46.7 um, PSI. So my bulb pressure has pushed this needle down, and it's allowing more liquid refrigerant into the evaporator. As the demand for cooling decreases, in other words, the system's caught up, the box is now nice and cool again, it cools off the bulb, it takes pressure off the diaphragm, and it closes the valve. It decreases the flow of refrigerant and raises the superheat. The load requirement drops, the evaporator cools down, okay, the bulb pressure is now under that of the evaporator and spring pressure, it's pushing up, so the little needle gets pushed up, and cools off and decreases the flow of refrigerant to the coil. With newer evaporators, there's a pressure drop from the metering device to the suction line. If the pressure drop exceeds 2.5 PSI, a TXV with an external equalizer line should be used. The external equalizer is connected to the suction line after the bulb. Okay, what it does, it, it it's used to compensate for the pressure drop from the inlet to the outlet of, outlet of the evaporator. We also have distributors on some of the newer and heavier coils. Distributors are octopus looking things that following the expansion valve on large multi-pass evaporators. You don't see this this often in refrigeration, it's more often in air conditioning. The distributors distribute the refrigerant through the multiple passes of the evaporator. The rate of the flow of liquid through the TXV is directly proportional to the load conditions. The forces that control a TXV is the sensing bulb, that's the gas in there that expands and contracts, that's the downward force that will open the valve. The other force is the evaporator pressure, it creates an upward force that will close the valve along with the spring pressure. The TXV is designed to work at equilibrium. There's adjustments you can make. By adjusting spring pressure, the superheat can be changed. TXVs can be internally or externally equalized. Internal has two lines. One is the liquid inlet, and the other is the evaporator port outlet. External has three lines, the liquid line, the evaporator outlet, and the equalizer line. 
With externally equalized TXV, the bulb must be mounted between the evaporator coil and the equalizer line. Make sure you don't put it on the side of the compressor, okay? It's very important that it's between the evaporator coil outlet and the equalizer line. If you put it after the equalizer line, you will not get the correct temperatures. The equalizer line must be as close as possible to the compressor side to ensure that 100% vapor is entering the quarter inch line. Any liquid coming back through the external equalizer will cause improper TXV operation. External equalizers are used on large evaporator coils where there is a pressure drop. The equalizer line will be connected onto the suction line to assist the evaporator pressure for proper operation. Superheat adjustments with TXVs are relatively easy. TXVs are adjusted at the factory. When an improper superheat is suspected, first check the manufacturer recommendations. Front setting the valve, turning it in, will start the coil or increase the superheat. By front seating, we are turning clockwise. Back seating of the stem valve, turning it out, will flood the coil and will lower the superheat. The best place to get a temperature reading is, this, is at the sensing bulb of the TXV. If you cannot access this, you can put it at the compressor side and add 2 PSI to your gauge reading, which basically is absolutely nothing if you look at the temp pressure charts. Convert the low side gauge to temperature. Subtract the saturation temperature, that's the boiling point that you converted from your gauges, from the suction line temperature. This is superheat. It's very important as you adjust superheat to realize it takes a few minutes for it to change. It's not instantaneous. You've got to be patient. When mounting the bulb, make sure the suction line area is clean for good heat transfer. If it's not, sand it. Make sure you have a good, secure, tight connection to the bulb. Secure it tightly by at least two metal straps. Throw insulation around it. It should not be mounted under the pipe as liquid refrigerant or oil can sit on it and cause incorrect readings. We have one other type of expansion valve we see in refrigeration quite frequently. It's known as the AEV or constant pressure valve, automatic expansion valve. The AEV does the same thing as a capillary tube. It acts like a water valve. It's not seen as often anymore as the TXV, but you will still see it. The force that operates the AV is evaporator pressure. It's an upward force on the bottom of the diaphragm that tends to close the valve. When you front seat the valve on the AV clockwise, you are opening the valve, which puts more liquid into the coil and lowers the superheat. When you back seat the valve on the AV counterclockwise, you're starving the coil. It's exactly opposite from the TXV. Atmospheric and adjustable spring pressure exert a downward force that will open the valve. AEVs are designed to maintain constant evaporator pressures. When checking AEVs, you rarely have a pressure port right next to the evaporator. So most often you want to add 2 PSI to your readings to account for the pressure drop of the long line set. Systems with AEVs and most systems with TXVs should have a receiver to show proper refrigerant flow to the valve. You cannot have vapor going to an AEV or TXV. It can only be liquids. Okay, so that's just something important to remember. If you have vapor bubbles going to your TXV, you're going to have improper refrigerant re pressures. Systems having capillary tubes can handle some vapor bubbles, so they'll rarely have a receiver. The receiver is a type of storage tank to hold extra refrigerant. Okay, this is an example of an AEV. Now notice, no bulb. Okay, so the cap protects an adjustable, um, an adjustment screw here. Cap normally goes, fits right over that, seals against the um, O-ring there. So we have, again, three types of metering devices we see most often on refrigeration systems. Okay, you have your cap tube, you have your AEV, and your TXV. By far the most frequent one you will find right now on most commercial equipment is your TXV. However, you will still find a bunch of cap tubes out there as well. If you're dealing with process refrigeration, in other words, where we have very little um, temperature changes in the equipment, you might find an AEV around.